I was 18 when I was raped. I went to Montreal with a friend to visit a guy we had gone to school with. We knew him and trusted him and stayed with his family for the trip. That's where he raped me, in his family's home while everyone slept, his mom's room only a few feet away. I was able to escape that night with the help of two friends who alerted our parents, took me to emergency, and then a rape clinic. And it happened very fast. Within hours, we were on new flights to Vancouver where our families were waiting. It was an incredibly difficult time. Moving on seemed insurmountable. But I didn't know that this wasn't going to be my only encounter with this kind of trauma. A few years later, when I was living in London going to university, I was 21. I was home alone one night and there was a knock at my door. I went to answer it. A man forced his way into my apartment. I realized who he was immediately. I spent a few months dating him the year before. He screamed, he pushed me down, he barricaded the only two exits in my apartment, he took my phone, grabbed the SIM card and put it in his mouth so I couldn't call the police. I screamed, I yelled, he grabbed a knife and continued to terrorize me for hours. That night, I was a prisoner in my own home. I was scared beyond belief. I screamed and yelled. He shoved my head into the ground, gave me a piece of paper, and told me to write my last words to my family. He said, if he couldn't have me, no one could. I thought I was going to die that night. After about five hours of struggling, I was able to convince him to leave before someone caught him. He was arrested and in prison a few hours later. There are many kinds of traumatic and terrifying events that change people's lives forever, like car accidents and natural disasters. Terrifying things. But what's significant about sexual and violent trauma is it's an act between people. It changes how we feel about humanity. And when trauma involves another individual, it becomes interpersonal. And so the challenges around it are largely social. As I reflected on what I had endured, I started to realize that what was most difficult about moving on was actually the conversations that I was going to have to have and the reactions of others. I dealt with denial from my social circle. People didn't seem willing or able to have the difficult conversations that needed to be had. It was almost like they were scared to be vulnerable. Somehow, by talking about what had happened to me, how it affected them, how they felt about it, was going to make it more real. But as you can imagine, it was already very real. I started to see patterns of misunderstanding and fear of trauma of this nature in our culture. If we want to affect change, I think there are three areas that we need to consider. And they pertain to proximity, non-action, and aftermath. Look to your left. Just do it. Look to your left. Look to your right. Look for the faces of the people in this room who you know, who you care about, and who you love. Most of you are between grades 10 and 12. 61% of sexual assaults take place before the age of 18. One in three women will experience a violent or sexual assault in their lifetime. Yes, that's your moms, that's your friends, 
that's your sisters, that's your cousins. Children and teenagers account for the largest percent of abuse of this nature. And most incidences occur in a home. Friends and family members, as well as acquaintances, commit over half of reported sexual abuse and rapes of both men and women. Today, this is the truth about trauma, and the effects are not exclusive to victims and to assailants. It's painful to talk about trauma, so we often don't. But we can't live in fear of conversation. After I was raped, and while the process of, of court started, the girl who was there with me was on the phone with my mom and her mom, and eventually the conversation got to, well, how did this happen to Devin? Why not my daughter? Maybe Devin did something that made him think that he could do this to her. Maybe she was too sexy. My mom got off the phone and she burst into tears. When she needed support for her daughter who had been raped, she got reason and she got blame. What I understand today is that my mom and our friends and those in my circle may have experienced something called vicarious trauma which relates to people who are indirectly affected by trauma, even just the retelling of it, that's how much it means to us. The same way traditions are passed down through generations, so is trauma. There have been 67 years since the Holocaust and there are still groups for friends and family of both survivors and victims of the Holocaust. The Woodstock abduction, which was a case about a little girl who was raped and murdered by a couple, has continued to affect its community. There have been reports of people who didn't even know the little girl or her family who've changed their lives. They've changed their routines. They change where they go. They change what they do. They change why, because they live in fear of what happened to one person. Interpersonal trauma is close to home because it's about each other and it changes how we feel about humanity. When I lived in London where the second incident happened, the walls were so thin as walls are in London that I could hear my neighbors brush their teeth. When I was screaming for help, nobody called the police. Nobody came to see what was wrong. I ended up finding out that later that night, one of my neighbors did hear me. She just didn't know what to do, so she did nothing. We have to ask ourselves, what is the difference between people who act and those who don't? So ask yourself for a moment, do you think if you heard someone in danger that you would help that you would race to pick up the phone and call the police. Ask yourself for a moment. Now, how do you feel when I tell you studies show you probably wouldn't? There's something called the diffusion of responsibility and the bystander effect, which are social psychological terms which refer to the phenomenon in which the greater number of people present, the less likely anyone is to help a person in distress. The idea is that the responsibility to intervene is lessened in the presence of a larger group because somehow we think the responsibility is shared by the onlookers. There was a case in 1964 about a young woman who was then 28 years old and her name was Kitty Genovese. She was walking home in Queens, New York and an assailant came and stabbed her. He left her briefly and he came back raped her, stabbed her repeatedly over the course of 30 minutes. And it is said that as many as 38 witnesses commented on having heard or seen the murder in action. Only one phone call was reported to have been made to the police. 
Kitty died on the way to the hospital. Our society's tendency towards non-action is a cultural issue and people are suffering. If we want to shift towards positive action, somebody is always going to have to be the difference maker. We have to stop waiting for someone else to point us in the direction of compassion and empathy and action, and instead, we have to lead the way. But getting actionable doesn't necessarily mean you have to be Hercules and get your Spartan on. It just means follow your moral compass. By not acting, we even encourage assailants. We tell the world there are no consequences for brutality. Sexual assault is one of the most wildly underreported crimes with over two thirds of attacks going unreported. That means most rapists will never spend a day in jail. When victims of trauma are asked why they didn't report an incident, they often comment on it not being important enough, they thought or that it was a personal matter they thought they had to deal with on their own. And it is personal. It is everyone's personal problem. Think about standing at the edge of a pond and throwing a large rock into the water. The disturbance isn't over when the rock hits the surface. It's where it begins, just like trauma. Trauma isn't exclusive to the event alone. It ripples out like a wave. Most often, victims of interpersonal trauma end up experiencing PTSD and depression. PTSD, as it's known, is an illness. And there are many reasons why someone may be more vulnerable to PTSD than the next person. And some of the reasons have to do with the severity of the crimes, with the frequency, or with the number of traumatic events. For example, most children who experience sexual abuse will go on in their lives to endure post-traumatic stress disorder. I was diagnosed with PTSD and depression when I was 23. I was exhausted. I was sad every day. I was contemplating suicide. I couldn't make it through a day. Everything seemed too much. My numbness and my tiredness was affecting my relationships, my ability to work, to be a leader. Everybody knew what had happened to me, but nobody knew what I was going through now or what to do about it. People didn't understand. I actually didn't know that I had PTSD until I had my first panic attack blackout. I woke up in the back of an ambulance. My anxiety made me cry so hard that I just stopped breathing. To this day, I have to work very hard on my memory. I still have night terrors. I suffer from an irritable bladder because of anxiety. I have to pee right now. I still have flashbacks. This is what it's like. The aftermath of the traumatic events transcended the terror of the events themselves. We think that trauma happens to one person. No. It happens to us. The trauma, the effects, the loss of trust, the broken hearts, it's all interpersonal. And while we can't legislate humanity, each of us plays a role in changing the dialogue and perception around trauma. If we want to see less victims and less assailants, we have to embrace vulnerability we have to ignite conversations. We have to encourage our social circle. We have to encourage victims to tell their stories. Victims, tell your stories. <laughs>
Let light shine where violence has cast a shadow. The moment you start to negotiate with yourself in the face of trauma or in reacting to someone that needs you, you have stopped the process of change. I'd like to end by suggesting there is no in-between. You are either a bystander or a difference maker in the face of changing trauma. Thank you.